Through God's own providence, I have come to befriend a homeschool family of 12 children and no twins. And there are many different flavors of homeschool family. This one in particular chooses to homeschool in order to support a wild and hyperactive lifestyle. A good number of these kids are white water kayaking competitors internationally and whatnot. They've taken me white water rafting and things of that nature. I was watching, they also own an assortment of GoPros apart from buying band-aids in bulk. And they film a lot of the crazy stuff that they do. They, they have a lot of BMX bikes, they have a lot of um, snowmobiles, things of that nature. And one of the kids was going off this jump, took it wrong, went down an embankment into trees, smacked his head really bad. He knew something was off. And his GoPro caught him saying, among the first of the things, when he stood back up, was, thank you, God. Which is to say, part of the embedded reaction in himself, nobody's thinking clearly after a crazy event like that, was crying back out to God with thanks. He knew something was wrong, so he staggered back up to the trail, heard his mom coming, and he went from this position to everything's fine as she drove by, and then knowing dad would be behind, then he just lied down in the trail so he would stop. He didn't want mom to freak out. He knew dad could handle it. And the mom was saying, can you believe they did this? Oh my gosh. And I responded to her, how beautiful that your kid's first reaction has to do with God. And I think, in a world of catastrophe and crisis, there's only two kinds of people. Those who actually reach out to God, either in petition or thanksgiving, and those who don't. Peter, cognizant of God, even in the midst of his doubt, cries out, Lord, save me! In the scriptures, water <clears throat> is a symbol of many things. If you look at baptism, water is a symbol of cleansing, of new life. There is no life without water. And so baptism is this wellspring of the interior life. But if you look at scripture as well, it says the Spirit of the Lord hovered over the waters that were formless and chaotic. Many ancient cultures that sailed had stories and myths and even gods of the sea because of the capricious nature of the ocean, of water, of a particular fear of drowning above many other forms of death. And so water has this dual nature, good and bad. Moses implants his staff, and the people of Israel walk through unharmed, protected and guarded by water. Those literally hell-bent against the will of God, Pharaoh, are swallowed up by the water. Water is not always something good, something holy. It's also chaotic and difficult. Here we find ourselves in this gospel. Jesus, after having performed a miracle, makes his disciples get in a boat. We miss that detail often. Why would they not wanting to be getting into a boat? 
They've been living in and around the Sea of Galilee all their life. They know the weather, they can read the signs, they know a storm is coming. Jesus forces them to get in a boat and go to the other side. And despite their better judgment, they follow him. This begs the question, why does Jesus sometimes throw curveballs our way? So in his active will, he knows things are going to be more difficult for us. He wills them even sometimes. Or in his passive will, he'll let difficult things befall us. He'll let someone else misuse their freedom and make my life more painful or more difficult. Ultimately, for the sake of freedom, which allows for love, does this happen? But it also necessitates the understanding that God is God even over chaos. If he makes them get into the boat, it means he knows what he's about. And then Jesus demonstrates his power over the waters of chaos by walking on them. In the process of recognizing him, they begin to fear. John, the contemplative among them, recognizes Jesus first. And in recognizing him, he goes to the hierarchy of the group, Peter himself. the head of the apostles and says, it is the Lord. And then Peter, brash and impulsive and quick to move, says, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come to you. He goes big or goes home. And then Jesus meets him at his word and says, come. Now, Peter has to step out of the boat. There's a praise and worship song that I love a lot. Among the first lines are, You call me out upon the waters, to the great unknown where feet may fail. There are times in your life and my life where the Lord calls us out of a place of stability a place of predictability, firmness of the ground, into a place where I'm no longer in control. Why? So that I may learn humble dependence on him who is Lord of all things, even chaos. And if you notice, as long as Peter has his gaze, his eyes affixed on Jesus, he's doing even the miraculous. Not by his own power, but by his humble dependence on the all-powerful God. When he takes his gaze off of Jesus and begins to look at the problems surrounding him, the waves, the wind, possibly lightning, whatever else is going on, and realizes, how could this be happening? Doubt increases. Worry increases. Anxiety, despair. He takes his eyes off of Jesus. He takes his eyes off of the Savior. He takes his eyes off of the solution of all of his problems. And he focuses on his problems. Now Jesus knows all things. He knows the heart of Peter, the first pope. He knows that you and I would be here today. He knows, as he's on the water, that coronavirus would strike us here and now, and all of the sufferings that that are to go with it. 
When Jesus acts in the life of Peter, knowing that these would be recorded in the scriptures, he does so in such a way that he communicates to us as well. That when we take our eyes off of Jesus, we succumb to sinking and drowning. When we keep our eyes on Jesus, we can do the unpredictable, the mighty and the miraculous. As if 2020 weren't bad enough, it came out two weeks ago that this is supposed to be a worse than normal hurricane season. Think of a hurricane from a satellite view. In the very center is a place of total calm. I was one and a half years old when, uh, now I forget the name of the hurricane, we were living in South Carolina, and my parents told me that for 45 minutes they got out of, of hunkering down, and I got to run around and play uh, to get some energy out from being cooped up in a closet for hours on end. And then you go back in because the second half of the storm is coming by. Inside of a hurricane is an eye, a place of total calm, surrounded by chaos. I think the hurricane is an incredibly powerful image for your life and my life. You see, when you and I were baptized, we became a place of indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The center of our souls, the center of our being, houses God. God comes to dwell with us. And when we live out of the centrality of our life, which is Christ himself, there is peace. When we live on the outskirts, the peripheral things of this world, that's where there's wind and rain and chaos and difficulty. That's where there's damage and unpredictability. Those blessed 300 and something people who go to the Adoration Chapel every week and for that one hour each week live out of the centrality of their prayer in silence. Go back to the first reading today. The Lord is not in the earthquake. He's not in the raging fire. He's in the silent whisper of the wind. And the prophet recognizes it. You and I have great pressures in our life. You and I have things that cry out for our attention and choke us with anxiety. And we're drawn to attend to this and to that and to forego the centrality of our life, Jesus, in our interior, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our interior, the love and breath of God the Father in our interior life. But those who go to the Adoration Chapel, who sit or stand or kneel before the Lord of all things, including chaos. It is they that live out of the blessed, what the monastics called the interior life, the life of centrality in Jesus Christ. And they that affix their gaze on him who is Lord of all things, including chaos. It is they who can even walk upon water. Now remember, Peter was crucified upside down, so following Jesus does not mean that all your problems go away. It means that you are given strength from on high to bear all things to orient your life, your being, your family, the ones you love, to things that endure forever. When you and I begin to fear, 
we lose sight of Jesus. There's a translation in another place of Scripture where Jesus' words say, Fear is useless. What is needed is trust. Fear is useless. It's good to have precaution over risky things. It's good to have prudence. But fear? What does fear actually serve but to debilitate us? Fear is useless. What is needed is trust in Jesus. Whenever you or I fail and choose to succumb to fear, they that confess it rid the power of fear in their lives, and they who have wandered into the peripheries of temporal worries, upon humbly depending on Jesus in confession, are immediately teleported back to the centrality of the interior life. They live again in that place of calm and peace. That feeling you get after you go to confession is not only just that your nerves are going away from having to put your sins into words in front of another human being. It's grace from on high that allows you to live out of that interior life again. You and I, when we begin to live out of the interior life, it changes everything. When prayer becomes something we thirst for, we seek, it changes everything. Women, you probably know this by now if you've spent any number of days with a man. We men are fearful creatures, but we don't like to show it. Fear is something that is uncontrollable, and we men prefer control. And when we get fearful, even though that's going on on the inside, what do we show on the outside? The emotion that we encode on the outside is anger. Now, quit nudging your husbands, and don't look at him. When men encode anger, most of the time it is not a righteous anger, a God-given drive towards justice and restoration in the face of an evil so that he can guard, protect, and secure his family. Sometimes that is the case. But it takes a lot of virtue and grace to get there. Most of the time when we men are angry, it arises out of fear. Fear that we will lose a success. Fear that evil will befall us. And we don't like feeling not in control. But women, next time you see a man who is angry, who is gruff, one who has toxic masculinity, that's a different homily. Pray for his courage, that he would not succumb to fear, that he would be man enough to live out of the interior life. That he would be humbly dependent upon Jesus to confess his sins, to be teleported back to the interior life. And out of that relationship with Jesus, out of that humble dependence on Jesus, he would be willing to cry out, Lord, save me. And by his following Jesus, so too the life of the family would follow to the glory of God the Father and the salvation of mankind. Praise be Jesus Christ. That song that I referenced is called 
Oceans, if you'd like to look it up. The refrain of the song says, Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. You and I live in a world of, Lord, I'll follow you as long as. If you don't ask this of me, if you don't, whatever. And most of us have conditions on our love because we're used to living in fear. What would it be like to say, Spirit, Holy Spirit, who dwells in my interior by way of baptism, lead me to a place where my trust knows no borders? The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen.